do you remember the first mirrorless camera? I'm going to show it to you. The Panasonic Lumix G1, launched in October 2008, was the first true mirrorless camera. And it was also the first ever Micro Four Thirds camera, making it a first on two significant technological fronts. It boasts a 12.1 megapixel image sensor, a 23 zone contrast detect autofocus system, a maximum sensitivity of ISO 3200, a top continuous shooting speed of 3 frames per second and a maximum shutter speed of 1 4000th of a second. While it packs a pop-up flash and 25 different scene modes, it lacks any video features whatsoever. Released in three different colors, black, red and blue, its grip features a strange, soft plastic coating that feels slightly sticky and tacky after a decade and a half. Still, the body is extremely compact and lightweight at just 360 grams or 0.79 pounds. So, how does a 15-year-old camera handle and shoot all these years later? So the Panasonic G1 was launched in 2008, and just to give some context, another camera released in 2008 about the same time as this was the Canon EOS 5D Mark II, which obviously was a transformative camera, really changed the landscape for DSLRs and cameras in general, mainly due to its uh, incredible video features. Which makes it interesting that one of the greatest strengths of mirrorless and one of the greatest strengths of Panasonic from this point forward would be video performance. And yet the G1 has no video features whatsoever. What does it have? Well, it has a 12.1 megapixel image sensor. It has a maximum ISO of 3200. It has no in-body image stabilization. It does have a pop-up flash. And it does have a fully articulating screen. I nearly said the word touchscreen then, but it's not actually a touchscreen. Uh, it's a TFT display with about 460,000 pixels. So it's pretty low res, it's TFT technology, so it's not that great quality. Um, the electronic viewfinder in here is about 1.44 million pixels, which for the time wasn't too bad. Um, it obviously doesn't hold up to EVFs of today, but still gives you a pretty good idea of the images you've taken. Um, when I first started using this camera, I wasn't a fan of the EVF, but more so the rear screen, because 460,000 dots, it doesn't give you a great deal, a deal of resolution, doesn't give you a great deal of detail. And it's kind of hard to see if the images you've taken, especially if it's like macro stuff, is particularly sharp or in focus and uh, you're going to have to re refer back to the EVF or wait till you've got the cards downloaded to your computer to see what you've actually shot. What else do we have here? We have the only two connectivity ports, which are a mini HDMI slot and a USB 2.0 uh, port. And on the other side, we have a single SD card slot. No surprises there. Now, while the G1 didn't sow the seeds for Panasonic's future in terms of video capability, it did sow the seeds for its future, at least until very recently, in terms of AF, because it has a very basic contrast detect autofocus system. It has 25 focus zones. It's pretty creaky and unreliable, especially in terms of shooting continuous. And if you do want to shoot continuous, you are limited to a burst rate of a blistering three frames per second. So this certainly isn't the camera to use if you want to do I was going to say fast action, but action of any kind. This isn't really a camera that's going to keep up with that. It does have some very basic face detection, and it also has a tracking mode, so you can lay down a focus point and it will follow that around the frame optimistically. Uh, in reality, that doesn't always happen. And basically, this is not an AF system that's in any way on par with uh, the cameras of today, but you can get by with it. Um, the fact that the articulating screen, I was going to say touchscreen again, the fact that the articulating screen isn't a touchscreen is kind of a pain because there is no joystick on the back of the camera either, which means that moving AF points is a little bit of a chore. In order to do so, you've got to hit um, one of the AF buttons, then press down and then uh, move it around pixel by pixel with the, uh, the directional pad on the back, which is not ideal if you're trying to do anything at any kind of speed. So the G1 is not a beast in terms of its resolution, it's not a beast in terms of its burst mode, it's not a beast in terms of its AF. What was its USP at the time back in 2008? Well, 
its USP was the same as Micro Four Thirds USP is today. It's the camera's compactness. I mean, it's incredibly small and dainty, even by today's standards. One of the contemporary APS-C DSLRs at the time is this, the Canon EOS 400D, or the Canon Rebel XTI in the US. And as you can see, it's not that much smaller. Um, it's obviously thinner, has a thinner profile, is ever so slightly shorter, but uh, it's not that much smaller purely in terms of the body. Where it does uh, have the advantage, as Micro Four Thirds still does to this day, is in terms of lens size, because it's all very well having a small APS-C body, but you still need larger lenses than you do on Micro Four Thirds. And Micro Four Thirds has the advantage of small bodies and small lenses. And that was true back then, and it's true now. The issue is, in 2008 when this camera was launched. Because it was the launch of the MFT standard, there were only two lenses available at launch. There was the 14 to 45 kit lens, and I wanna say the 40 to 200 millimeter kit lens as well. So two lenses. So this means this was only available in the kit form. You couldn't buy it body only because there were no lenses to buy for it. So with the 14 to 45, this camera set you back 800 bucks in 2008. I'm not a fan of the layout in general, and admittedly, back in 2008, all the manufacturers were still kind of figure out where they were going to put the knobs and dials, where the controls were going to go. And there's a lot of interesting design decisions here. For starters, um, the top left plate is the uh, focus selector switch, where you can switch between manual, AFC, AFS, and it kind of feels like there's a lot of dead space here. We've got the dial, we've got the pop-up flash button, and that's it. The rest of this feels kind of like dead space. We could put something else there. We've also got some interesting decisions on the right-hand top plate. So things like the uh, the single or continuous burst shooting that's on a separate switch along with um, the self-timer. Uh, the on-off switch at the bottom, which I actually found in my experience that gets flicked a lot in my camera bag. So I found the camera being turned on a lot. And uh, that's not good in terms of saving the battery life, which for this camera I think is about 350 shots CEPA rated. So it's not the best battery life in the world. It's also interesting in terms of the mode dial on the right hand side. So the camera has a full mode dial, but it's kind of bloated because really all I'm interested in is, um, is M for manual, S for sensational, <laughs> A for amazing and P for professional and the automatic mode. But then we've got six or seven different scene modes. There's a portrait mode, landscape mode, a sport mode, a close up mode and the scene options. Um, they could kind of all have been stuffed into one or two options on the dial. It, it feels like overkill to have them all here. And uh, I think even though those are modes sort of geared towards newcomers, I don't, I don't in real terms know a lot of people that actually use those modes, even newcomers who aren't familiar with things like shooting at night or shooting action. Again, not that this is really a camera you would shoot action with. Understandably for a camera from 2008, the menu system is somewhat basic, which on the plus side means that you can find everything you need pretty quickly and easily, um, but you can really see how the grammar of menu systems has evolved over the years. For example, there's a My Menu system. Now to the modern understanding, My Menu kind of means a customizable menu where you can put in all your favorite settings or things you want to change. But here, the G1 keeps track of the last five or six settings that you've tinkered with, and it puts those in a My Menu. So if you've most recently adjusted I don't know, white balance, uh, screen brightness, and histograms, those will appear in your My Menu. Now, a couple of cool things you can do in the menus here that aren't available in some modern cameras is not only turn on a histogram, but you can also position the histogram around the screen. So if you want the histogram at the top right, or in the center middle, or at the bottom left, you can put that anywhere you want it. Uh, in terms of guides, there's also a guide I've never seen before, uh, maybe because I don't use guides that often, but one of them has uh, two lines that you can move around the frame. So you have a vertical and a horizontal line, you can kind of move them around, so you can always find um, the intersecting point and place that wherever you would like it. Um, it's kind of like Robocop vision from the Robocop movies. It's something I haven't noticed in modern cameras, but again, I don't play around in the guide menus too much. Now the fact that the camera has no IBIS kind of is what it is. A lot of cameras today don't have IBIS, but given that Micro Four Thirds really kind of built its reputation having the best IBIS system in the business, uh, it took a little while to get used to especially given um, how austere the ISO is. I mean, shooting ISO 3200, you kind of forget these days that um, you can kind of pump the ISO up pretty highly, but 3200 here, the images kind of degrade, they kind of fall apart a lot sooner than you would expect from a modern system. But again, we're talking about a 12.1 megapixel sensor from 2008, so I guess that's to be expected. In terms of the images themselves, they're perfectly serviceable. 
Um, this is a camera I could quite happily use today, aside from the interface issues and the foibles and trying to get my modern head around an older camera. The files it produces are fine, absolutely fine. What I would say is that they are quite flat, uh, they're lacking pop dimensionality, um, the contrast is kind of flat, uh, the colours uh, the colors aren't terrible, um, certainly when it comes to skin tones and things they lean a little bit towards the magenta, but the colours are actually fine, I, I even prefer the colour signs in here to Sony cameras, I mean it's, it's no secret people don't tend to like Sony colours, um, I prefer it to Nikon colours as well, but it's certainly not a patch on Olympus, Fujifilm, Canon and Co. Another couple of foibles that stood out to me were, again, I take for granted that mirrorless cameras can shoot silently. It's one of the most useful things about mirrorless cameras. However, the Panasonic G1 does not, in fact, shoot silently. And I guess not all cameras do still to this day, but it's a pretty common feature in mirrorless cameras, uh, but it wasn't widespread until sometime after 2008. And the shutter on this, it is pretty noisy even by DSLR standards. So that's a thing. The other thing is the fact that this camera has a maximum shutter speed of one four thousandth of a second, which is fine most of the time, but in terms of working with bright light, uh, you do kind of miss shooting at eight thousand, sixteen thousandth uh, and above. All of that being said, while I still wouldn't necessarily recommend that you go out and buy a Panasonic G1 today, because basically any camera released, or at least any mirrorless camera released since 2008 is going to be head and shoulders above this one. It's amazing how capable this 15 year old camera still is. Yeah, the 12.1 megapixel resolution is going to limit you. Yeah, the ISO 3200 top sensitivity is going to limit you. Yeah, the lack of IBIS is at least going to limit me. Yes, the, the lack of video is going to limit a lot of people. But it still takes a great picture. And again, the body is only half the story. I and mean, when you stick a modern lens on this, or even a not so modern lens on this, it's gonna take a great image. Certainly the images, the files that are produced, as I mentioned, they are kind of flat, they lack dimensionality, the colors are a little bit off, but it's nothing that a bit of tweaking that we do on any image from any camera anyway, won't fix. And uh, given that Canon and Nikon, the big boys of the industry, only in a meaningful way jumped on the mirrorless bandwagon five years ago, and this is a decade before that. It's really interesting to see, you know, this kind of, I wouldn't say it holds its own, but certainly if I were to take an image on this and an image on a modern mirrorless camera, I think you'd be pretty pushed to tell the difference. So I hope you've enjoyed this little trip down memory lane, the first ever mirrorless camera and the first ever micro four thirds camera. Thank you for watching and I'll see you again next time.